power, no cohesion, but I, I will have a point. Um, so have your cake and eat it too. The idea that was percolating in my head, besides wanting to serve cake, was that I have noticed some folks approach the captioning uh, idea of how we might add captioning and look at it in ways that they can add other things that their station needs or uh, access funds or replace things at the station that need to be replaced that they've been blocked from replacing through bureaucracy. So what I want to do is maybe like just talk up a couple of those ideas I've seen, brainstorms among folks if anybody has an idea of how they might, even if it's not like, oh yeah, we could do this right away, just like thoughts. Because what I've really found interesting here is that um, I feel like closed captioning has been almost the equivalent of the SD to HD thing where like people who had had you know, their studio and gear all like this and there's not been a real reason for stuff to change, now there's this new thing you have to add and even though a closed captioning system should not conceptually mean you need to replace your playback system. Maybe your playback system's on an old version of Windows and you've been needing to replace it anyway and now is the moment that you present that because, you know, it goes as part of a larger bundle or whatever. So that's, that's my concept. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a couple of the places I've been working with and what I've seen them do. I will break for people to get a glass of milk um, and then uh, flip the tape and, uh, and then I will, uh, you know, open it up to ideas, hopefully. Um, so, uh, first one, I've just been uh, working with the city of Atlanta, Georgia, a big one. Uh, they, they bought a caption encoder and a new playback system to replace their old playback system, but it was all part of a larger need to update the technology that they could not do because, and I'm not sure I'm going to get the bureaucracy uh, described correctly, but they're, they're under some sort of... Uh, you know, city regulation that they can't buy anything that's not certified as not having any Chinese components. I think it's a security thing. Yeah. I'm sure other cities are under this too. So go ahead and buy yourself some broadcast servers and technologies and frame sinks that don't have any Chinese chips in them for your station. It's, it might be possible, but I, I think everything has it in some degree. So they've been unable to update, you know, not just their cable cast system, but they had uh, two engineering PCs they used to drive other components. And they couldn't buy a new rack PC because they couldn't find any way. So what they ended up doing with COVID is they were able to use COVID as the excuse for um, updating their disaster recovery solutions. Because if they all have to be remote again, they needed to have a better solution for city staff to operate it remotely. So that gave them a way to put through a, a purchase process. We still, they still had to do uh, not quite an RFP, but they had to put out a scope of work, and me and two other bidders received it and responded and stuff. But they were able to basically circumvent you know, this path that was made so onerous they could never update their outdated servers or outdated PCs. And they were able to do it all under this emergency preparation fund. So now they put in the new gear, and it's so that it's more accessible if we have another, you know, everyone work from home period. And it allowed them to actually insert a caption encoder into their workflow they didn't have before while they replaced everything else. The encoder was the smallest part of all the stuff I ended up doing for them, but I think in a way it was like their foot in the door. They're like, hey, if we work with you to do the caption encoder, we can take care of these other stuff that's been on the back burner that we haven't had a solution for. Uh, that was a bit more of a stretch of you know, adding things in captioning, but um, I would also say that there's been a couple stations I've talked to, including one in, in here in Wisconsin, where as I was quoting them um, the captioning solution, we talked about the fact that you know their playback system had some upgrade needs, and in the end, they didn't do the captioning at all yet. They did a rebuild of the playback first. Um, and I've talked to others who say, okay, well, while we do this, we're going to reach out and try to get funds to fix the audio in our council chambers. Because you're not going to get good captions if you have terrible audio. And you might not normally have a good path of getting anyone to justify you spending X, Y, Z dollars on the microphones. But if you're tying it to the captioning and the captioning is legally required and the captioning is coming out of you know, some disaster funds or COVID funds or something, then updating the audio, if it's part of what you need to do to make the captioning work, is legitimate. So, I mean, I'm not here to say, hey, why don't we all go update our audios? But, you know, there's aspects. There's, everyone's got things that they have kind of been unable to deal with or been unable to add. And captioning, because it's required and most places aren't doing it, is more of a hot, hot button issue that you can... Um, wrap things with if there are other aspects of your facility that you need to address or um, other contracts, you know, like if you, 
if you needed to address uh, video streaming, you're streaming and maybe you don't like where you're streaming to, uh, and you want to make sure that what you're going to be doing will cover captions being delivered to stream, maybe even like multiple languages of captions. It could be an opportunity to, you know, look at changing your contract from whatever the city had signed up for 15 years ago, early Granicus or something like that. Or you're, you know, again, I'm, I'm not saying, oh, you should look at captioning and add ABC. I'm saying captioning might be the opportunity to see what else you could address. All right, I think I've hammered this into the ground, the same idea. So uh, let's, let's see if there's anybody else that's coming to mind besides um, Atlanta and um, the folks in Wisconsin who updated their, their system. Boy, I'm blanking now. Um, fiber. Actually, I'm working with one right now who is, um, in order to update their captioning, they decided to take the opportunity to also switch their playback system from server vendor X to server vendor Y. And now they're also trying to switch from where they're located inside the county. Their gear is all in a county building that is connected to a judicial building. So now it's like really tricky for them to even be able to get in. This is uh, Santa Cruz, California. Anytime they have to go reset any of their equipment, it's an ordeal because they have to get you know signed in and they don't really like them. So now they're looking at using this whole process, even though it started with just fixing captioning issues, they're looking at using that as a way to get the cable company to activate fiber at their place so they can move their playback to their place and they don't have to like beg the county every time they need to go in to install something or access. So again, it's kind of a, we started here and now we're over here. They started trying to add some captioning, they updated their playback and now they're trying to move the playback origination. But yeah, I guess what I'm saying is it's, um, it's a tool that you can kind of navigate around with. All right, I've, I've, I've hammered this on the ground. Can somebody else talk for a second? Does anybody have any ideas? Mike, can you, can you think of anything, I'm putting you on the spot, can you think of anything you've seen where folks in addressing captioning have, uh, have, have also addressed other stuff or? Yeah, I think you've really hit on it, uh, Daniel. It's, it's sometimes when you're, you're looking at new gear, you realize that some of your other gear is Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, the other part I forgot besides updating a gear is that you can add new workflow elements too. Like uh, you can get transcripts out of this that you can feed into systems that are searchable. So some of the playback systems are saying now that they'll do searchable uh, transcripts tied in. Um, there's MAMS, Media Asset Managers, that let you search that. Um, right, go ahead. Editing systems that take, take, take the transcripts and they integrate the transcripts into the editing. So yes. You can actually basically speed up your production process. That's right. So obviously you can take like a, a SRT or something, a CC, dump it into Premiere. But there's a, thank you for bringing this up, there's a really great editing tool for podcasters called Descript. Has anybody here used it before? Oh, you're going to love it. Um, so it's made mostly for podcasters, but you can use it with video too. And it allows you to edit by deleting words out of the transcript. It will delete that out of the, out of the scene. Um, so it can give you a way to like, you know, dump your thing in, and then you can actually edit based on the text. You know, you can just take that whole period before the meeting where it was mumbling, and all right, everyone, we're going to start in a couple minutes, and just highlight and cut that, and then go down to the end, and um, and then um, descript. Go ahead, Mike. Can you please. Talk about the foreign language. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's the other part. Is if you are captioning in English, it gives you a source that you could then use to get a foreign language translation. And um, I'm working with a school district in Illinois. Uh, school District 300, uh, they are going to be using, well, they actually are. We signed up, we're using a um, traditional stenographer to do English captioning. But then there's also a second person who's going to be listening and speaking Spanish into a microphone. And then on that end, they also have the spoken Spanish, you know, very clearly being spoken in a microphone, being uh, used with AI software being turned into Spanish captions. So that we have English captions, Spanish captions, sorry, English captions, Spanish captions, and a Spanish audio track out of this. Um, go ahead. Wait, wait, wasn't there a product that, that uh, has come out that has like an interface that a user can control for, for different language captions? Yes, I actually just learned about this. Um, when I was doing an ATOA presentation, right. and um, I pointed them to Midpen Media Center, and they used it for this Art of Disabilities Festival, and Carrie Saxon said it was really great. Uh, a company I, uh, called VZP, 
Um, guy had left uh, Caption Colorado. I think he was like COO of Caption Colorado when they got acquired by Vitech. And the product is called Reach, R-E-A-C-H. And um, it's basically his platform for doing cart services, which is like captioning, but for like university classes. You know, if somebody's a student, they need transcription. Uh, it's for doing it with either human or AI on his end. But what's really fascinating, like what Mike's pointing out is, he gives uh, all the end users, you know, the students who are getting the cart class or uh, end user, you can basically point your phone at a QR code, bring up the browser that has those captions, and you can select what languages you want it auto-translated into and display them side by side. So you could have the English captions on the left, and I test it out with Kamai, Cambodian language translation, and there it is in all the characters. Or we did it with Hebrew, and it's running, you know, right to left, and things that you can't do on a television because it's not going to have the right characters, you know, captioning is only going to display traditional Roman characters and left, right. But you can do that if you're having people look at it in their browser um, or on their phone or tablet, you know, any, any browser location. So you could use that to give all of your constituents access to it in their own native language. You know, if you were translating on your end, you're going to have to pick, we're just translating to Spanish or we're just translating to Spanish or Vietnamese. But if you're Madison and you've got a whole range of you know languages represented you could say all right you know come here and then in the drop down here's the instructions select your language you will then see you know the meeting as translated in real time into your language um, and you can do that for individuals or you could take that and you could project that the way i am not projecting anything uh, you could project that and in real time you could you know get the auto captions or professionally generated captions on the left and when I say professional, I mean, you know, that $100 plus stenographer, and then the translations. And let's be honest here. If you're using auto captions and they're mostly good, but there's still errors, those errors, you know, get compounded in translation. So if your end goal is the most readable translation, you do want to try to start with professional English, even though it's a lot more expensive. Because we can do automated Spanish off of automated English, but again, it, it compounds. You're not going to get the absolute best. It's not going to translate idioms properly, et cetera. Um, um, so that's that VZP reach. Um, I really like it. I'm, that's what we're uh, testing out. Not with, with the school district, we're testing out feeding to YouTube, but we're, we're using VZP for the translation. Are you, are you running into people who are providing those types of live translation services for meetings in, in room, you know, or events? And then splitting it off for, for a fee? I've, I mean? I've, I've run into um, a few places where they'll have an interpreter on hand if there's a request, but they don't have them at every meeting. And then I've talked to some that do like keep an interpreter, you know, a Spanish interpreter or a ASL interpreter um, available and in, I don't know, I want to say picture in picture, you know? Um, it's expensive and it's hard to coordinate. And when I say hard to coordinate, I mean, you know, you, you have to have people and it can't just be like one person because they're not going to always be available. So I've noticed it tends to be like cities that are very committed and tend to be, you know, a larger area where they're going to have access to multiple, you know, people. Um, let's see. Uh, any other questions? Mike, please. Great question. So I'm going to give you guys two totally opposite answers. The first answer is that you can't trust any of the numbers because it's all BS and they can report whatever numbers they want. Okay? It's like if everybody could rank themselves on a dating app as a 9.7, you know, oh, 9.7, 9.7, this whole thing is attractive, so right? Like, is not an independent rating there is no independent rating. Each company gets to run their own test with their own content, run it however many times they want choose which results to cherry pick, which is why everybody says that they are in the high, mid 90s. They all started saying they were in the high 80s and then everyone has crept what they say they're at. So that's my one answer is all the numbers are BS. And my other answer is 97% because that was the latest thing I read on a report from the engine that has the most accurate and they were like here and they actually broke it down. I have the image on my phone. If I was smart, I would have prepped this. Uh, they broke it down by accent group. So like how uh, you know, accurate it is with um, Southeast Asian accents, how accurate it is with um, South 
Asian accents, how accurate it is with African accents as a group. And, you know, obviously it drops depending on the accents, but their highest group they had, you know, listed as 96 point something or 97. So it gets more accurate. These things are getting really good. But at the same time, not all of the engines, not all the implementations are really good. So. Is that improved? Because there's some, isn't there some technology that it can actually recognize a certain person's voice? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the highest quality of, you know, you could really get is training it on one individual. Yeah, and then it's the next step is like, what's the highest quality thing that will work well feeding it a range of voices? A lot of them do speaker identification, but they do it really poorly. They will say, oh, we'll put a carrot every time the speaker changes, and then the carrots will occur in the middle of sentences, every after every third word. Like, they get way too sensitive, I think. But no one's Oh yeah, for sure. So Please. I mean, are, so are, and then is there any integration with those types of uh, AI robots that pick out the speakers for for uh, shot selection? Because That's, because you're starting to see those systems, right? Uh, the, those systems coming up where you've got basically like an AI pulling shot for a director. Yeah. So uh, I don't know a lot about those, but I did hear someone in there just talking about the system they use uh, using the microphones to know who's speaking. And I've uh, at any, I mean, it's been a while since I've been at NAB, but at NAB a couple years ago, I, uh, I w hung out at a booth and just watched for a while. It was an Indian company who was showing off using the AI to recognize logos on screen, recognize, you know, personalities. And I, I think that stuff is like rough, but advancing. But I haven't seen yet. I mean, actually, I take that back. There is one thing. Enco has an option where you can have all the mics run individually. So like, let's say you're at a news station, you've got all the news anchors' mics into the soundboard, into the captioning thing. I think you can then like assign. But obviously, you're not going to, in like a council meeting, ever have the exact same people on. You know, it's, I think those tools are there, but they're not yet in a way we can use. Um, but on that, on that subject, one of the systems I was uh, evaluating and, and testing out here, they were showing the speech to text and the facial recognition together where they would say, all right, we've trained it to identify Trump and the Queen of England and Bernie. And then they would allow you to search for words or show me all, all scenes that feature this person. So I, I think we are going to be there before too long where you would be able to search the council for when this counselor was speaking just based on, you know, whose mouth is moving. Um, I will also say this, though. I know we're almost all stuck on SD, right? Uh, and a few stations do have HD delivery. Captions really make it really clear to me how the HD is so needed for reading text. Yes, you can read the caption text, okay, you know, on an SD signal. But then I'm sitting there watching the screen. I'm like, oh, yeah, we can't read anything that's on the monitor, on the projector, because it's been crunched down to SD. So I'm, I'm not saying we'll get anywhere with this, but I think if we wanted to, we could say, hey, under the ADA, we're required to provide effective communication. And part of that is the captions being readable, right? But also part of that is the presentations by the counselors and the committees and the individuals being readable. And if they're not readable in SD because 640 by 40 is just not enough pixels, then there maybe there's like, I don't know, if I, I'm not a lawyer, but maybe there's an aspect to argue that under ADA uh, effective communication, you need the, the right amount of resolution to have effective communication. It's not effective when you can't read the PowerPoints. Go ahead. And even any like lower third graphics that we're putting in, even any like lower third graphics or things like that that we're putting in in our HD workflow, mm -hmm. by the time that gets stepped on in SD, it's not readable. If you're putting yeah. agenda items up there as a lower third, by the time it hits SD, or or worse, AT&T's 480 by 480, right. it's garbage. Also, speaking of 480, 480 AT&T signal, we just put in captioning for Elk Grove Village, and we got it on all of their signals except Uverse, because Uverse doesn't, you know, we called uh, the staff person's wife who was at home, pulled up the signal that has, you know, captions in the signal, but there's no button in the Uverse interface to turn on closed captions for the 99. For other channels, I think so, but I think in the 90, and again, I've not used Uverse, so I could be speaking out my butt, but I think when you're on channel 99 and you're browsing through their interface there, I don't believe they give you an option to turn on captions in those. 
And I think it's because they take a Windows Media Stream. I don't think that that's capable of bringing the captions. That was, uh, we don't get too far into this, but that was the subject of the Dearborn suit um, with UVerse. Really? And it, I thought that at t fixed that issue, but if you're saying that's not, saying not it's the not. case, it wasn't working for Elk Grove. Maybe the encoder. They need, maybe they need. Maybe they need a different encoder. I have some memory of at t um, only being able to run it one way. So either the captions were going to be on all the time, oh. or they were going to be off all the time. And yeah, so I, you have to put them open captions in the signal burned on the screen because they don't have a way to. Yeah. You're, you're driving me to drink now. Okay. I have <laughs> uh, well, we've got so, a gallon in just a couple minutes, and the, the booze sales goes towards the organization, so everybody drink heavy. So can uh, we talk money a little bit? Yeah. Um, do you have any? Uh, no. Um, do I, have <laughs> I got 20 bucks. Do <laughs> yeah. you got um, any tapes in yeah. the car? Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that some people are using uh, emergency COVID money yeah. um, for emergency communications, redoing their signal paths, mm -hmm. uh, redoing. Um, have you run into folks using other other types of other types of pots of money for this type of work? Um, disability disability access money, um, uh, yeah, supplemental grants, or you know, you know, or human rights funding or something like that. Um, I, I wish I had an answer that was that there's been a lot. I've had folks talking about it. Obviously, okay. Let's just be straight up. Most of it has come out of peg capital funds. Most of the places I've had ad captioning, we're able to move on it somewhat quickly compared to, you know, folks have to take two or three years and build the budget because they said, hey, let's pull from our PAG capital funds and just buy this gear outright. So that's not been everybody, but that's been a large part. Um, there have been some that have tried to like, it's not ARPA, but whatever the, the last round of um, COVID money, there's some that have tried uh, getting in on that. Um, in some of the places, they've chosen to do it where they basically get a block of hours that each hour has a cost of like 20 or 25 hour, dollars an hour, and then they're passing it to the, to the groups, to the, to the city. You know, they're, they have an a, arrangement where they're, you know, being paid for the meetings that they're covering as an institution, so and now they're just adding the captioning cost to their so chargeback. The, the yes. Client. Yeah, they're not the client. The, the city, client, they're the, the yeah, they're the uh, they're the nonprofit intermediary, and so they've they've bundled, they've taken it, those hours and added them to what they are billing under their contract. And then the, another group was actually trying to get disability funds. I don't know if they did, but they said that the disability commission in their community had funds that they were willing to give in grants. So as they implemented, they were then going to try to get the cash back they had spent by. Getting it, you know, they wanted to implement it right away, but they wanted to try to maybe get some of that money out of the Disability Commission over the next year. What they did that was really helpful is they actually tested the product with the Disability Commission before they implemented. They had been using Vitek or Caption Cloud or somebody for a long time. I'm sure it was a technical issue, but they had a crazy long delay where their captions were like 30, 40 seconds behind. When normally they should be like four, five, six seconds. I don't know what it was. It wasn't something to do with the captioners, but whatever the issue was, they had a really bad delay. Um, so they started looking at automated captions. And they showed both sets of captions to their disability commission before making a purchase. And then they you know, got positive feedback. They liked the AI captions because, well, A, they weren't as delayed. And B, there's no, there's no summary with AI captions. With human, you guys have probably watched the news or ball game and you see the captions. And sometimes they get a little bit behind and they just kind of, summarize the last two sentences as quickly as they can, right? Which is a bit more dangerous with government meetings than it is with a football game or something. So automated captions might not get every word exactly right, but it is not going to skip over half of a sentence or summarize it in a different way. It's gonna to try to nail every single utterance, even if they repeated themselves, you know. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, getting back to budgets, yeah, you may find, um, in our case with the city of Madison, if we do pursue captioning, that's not gonna come out of uh, the media team's budget or the IT department's budget. That's gonna come from the Department of Civil Rights, which has a language access program, and they have, of, of their own volition, decided that captioning, both English and in other languages, falls under their purview. So, and, and, and I think for, for a lot of counties, particularly, um, and states, that's the case. Um, I mean, and, and, and it's come from like courts where courts.
courts have ruled that you actually had to have an, a, a, an appropriate language interpreter as a civil rights measure to be able to get have equal justice, for example. It's like the case in Minnesota courts. And, and, and so, I mean, I think the thing that you're suggesting, uh, Boyce, is that uh, that those divisions, either in state or local government, could be your friends as you're looking at sort of deploying solutions. Absolutely. And, and, and again, they would be the ones who would be budget would be coming out of the DCR budget within the LAP area. Um, we, however, of course, seeing this coming, are making sure that anything that we purchase with our money well, is going to move in that direction and, and, and be ready for that. The other thing I suggest is they, they probably have access to other types of granting sources that you don't, too. So yeah. whether it be state, no. or federal, state or federal or private granting sources. Yeah, that's a really great point. They don't put it in the general fund. They right. Don't yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a really great point. They have access to funds. They have access to grants. And I think maybe one way to think of it is that we, defining we as those of us who control the channel and the streams and the technology side, we are the ones that will actually have to do it because it's our SDI signal that has to have the captions and us feeding the stream. But it doesn't necessarily have to be our budget if there's another group or another aspect that it could fall under. I'm not seeing that. I mean, I think Madison's more the exception in that you guys, you know, have that kind of formalized. I think a lot of the cities I don't see uh, really clearly crystallized disability commissions. They, I mean, if they have them, I'm not always overlapping. Um, but those, those, that's who's, that's who's, if you can figure out who's responsible for making sure that everything ADA is compliant, you know, everything's ADA compliant with, with everything else, that's the person who's got the highest, you know, concern, the liability, and might have, you know, be able to point you to where you can get the funding internally. Yeah, mine's a little a little off topic, but same realm. When we talk about uh, well, the American Recovery Act and some yeah. of that money that municipalities get, uh, you know, I, I got okay to spend some money on the municipal room, but I don't really know. And maybe this is a lawyer question: Where does some? Where do you think some of our equipment or our realm can fall within that American Recovery Act, and even more so in with that captioning? Completely. In Everything like no, I, I don't know. We, yeah. we'd have to talk more about um, you know put it. You'd have to put together you know kind of your your rationale for why that um, that equipment would fall into that uh, type of uh, funding bucket. But um, I would guess that you could do that. And I think and that was kind of what Daniel was saying earlier yeah, too. Is yeah. is is they were using, you know, some bucket of funding that was more, you know, COVID related, but they were able to put that nexus between, um, you know, COVID funding and, you know, um, and that and that equipment, you know, why that met that need. Same with translation. Like I, I honestly think, you know, the need for communicating to all of oh yeah, thank you. The need to communicating to all of the citizens gets more amplified in the pandemic. You suddenly start to realize like, oh, if this small group of our community is not getting effective messaging, that's problematic. Like we didn't think about it maybe as much before, but it's real clear now. Well, I mean, and, and particularly if you're an organization that's doing health communications work mm -hmm. or public safety communications work in, 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 under pandemic conditions, there are that's like a key area, so. Um, so yeah, you can tie that back to basically uh, informing the citizenry about what their health need, what you know, how how, well, about health conditions and health information, yeah. right? Um, um, all right. So we've been mostly talking about like the big picture of like how can I get money to do the real captioning? How can I implement a big thing? I want to leave you guys with one real simple, easy to use, nearly free tool that if you need to put a video up on Instagram or Facebook and you need to quick add captions to it and maybe you need to burn them in because it's going to be on Instagram you want people to see it go by or whatever um, you can also use this tool to run captions for a longer program export the caption file and dump it into Premiere or whatever you use I don't think it would work great for like a really really long meeting or something but it'd be really good if you're doing um, you know a half hour health information thing you're like this needs to be captioned and maybe in other languages it's called headliner h-e-a-d-l-i-n-e-r I think the website is headliner.app, A-P-P, but just look for a headliner. Um, it's 
really great. And like I said, it's priced for, you know, a social media user thing. So you can basically use it for free as long as your expectations are, you know, not too high. Like if you want to export more than a certain amount in a certain time or you want maybe, I don't think there's a watermark, but, you know, there's like a couple of things on the free one where you're like, okay, that wouldn't be great for like a big institution. But I, uh, for, for these past conferences, I did a cameo video with Chris Gethard, who's a um, comedian, podcaster, from public access background. And, you know, I did this thing, I put it up, and I was like, oh, wait a minute, I didn't caption it. Like, here I am violating my own message that we should be captioning these things. And I was like, oh, I gotta caption it. So I brought in the headliner. It generated automatically. I was able to look through and figure out what words were wrong and just change them right there. I was even able to add, like, because I was doing a happy birthday peg thing, so I put, you know, birthday balloons and emojis on screen. You, you can definitely go overboard. but. It's really great because you could use it with virtually no training. It is an app you install on the computer and you have to have like an account for it to sync to and stuff. But virtually, or maybe it's even in the browser, it's virtually no training. You, you could have someone demand that, you know, the PSA you're about to put up be captioned and you could probably figure it out in headliner in an hour compared to, you know, having to get real captioning tools. And if you're looking for a real captioning tool that's professional for editing captions, it's called Cadet, C-A-D-E-T. That's more complicated, hard to use, but it was built by, um, well, WGBH funded it. It was built uh, on a national level as a free open source style tool for, for this. So, you know, if you ever hit a wall, you're like, oh, we have to deal with our caption files. That's a great tool. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, is it, are these like some are these similar to like the transcribe function in Adobe Premiere? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and definitely, you can you can use built-in plugins and stuff in, in Adobe Premiere too. Um, I like Descript as a standalone thing for the fact that it makes it really easy to edit the text uh, and jump right to the points in it. And I like Headliner because it makes it really easy to actually do it on like vertical videos and put it on screen for things. You know, like. I don't know if you guys are gonna put something on your station's Snapchat or TikTok. You gotta, gotta make it look cool like the kids like. Uh, but Premiere has it built in, and there's also a couple of plugins you can use. There's one from Digital Anarchy called Transcriptive, and then there's I think Premiere's built in and uh, a couple others. Um, the last thing I'll say is we're just hitting the last thing about quality for a second because I'm running out of time. Um, all of these different things are built on speech to text engines, and I, I don't care if we're talking about like an app or uh, built into a server or, you know, one of the things I'm selling that's a standalone captioning thing. All of them use speech-to-text engines and the quality of everything depends on how good of a speech-to-text engine did they choose and then how, how well did they build around it? How well did they build additional filters for word changing or how well did they, you know, tweak the audio or whatever. So um, one of the cool things about Premiere is you can actually run the same content in Premiere using different plugins that have different engines. And one of the ones that I really like, that transcriptive, will let you use multiple engines in it. So they'll say, run our file with Speechmatics, which is the one that the commercial products I use has the best results with, then run it through with IBM Watson, which is like a fraction of the cost, and see what quality you get. And again, you don't have to test every piece of content you have, but if, it can be kind of handy sometimes to take like a four or five piece, four or five minute piece of content and just try it in two or three different things, and then you can show, hey, there's a difference, you know, like this one I can actually read and make sense. This one makes a little less sense. This one called the mayor a name I don't ever want him to call the mayor. You know, like, so. Or maybe if you run into an engine that you know just can't get one word. Yeah. Like, like this, the whatever engine Zoom uses cannot do the word alder. Really? Can't do it. And they don't give you a, uh, <laughs> they don't give you a word swap filter. Yeah, and that's actually the biggest thing you get when you buy something as opposed to using all the free tools out there is you get word filtering, yeah. right? So if you're using YouTube and YouTube doesn't get it right, there's not much you can do about it but download the file and edit it. If you're using Zoom, be thankful you got free captioning. But when you're paying a bunch of money for it, you can go in and say, don't say elder, say older. Don't say Bayer butt kiss, say Mayor Buketis or whatever, you know? Uh, yeah, hold on. <laughs> I feel like uh, Sally Jesse Raphael or Phil Donahue running around. So let's say that I am a, a smaller city in Wisconsin, okay. and I'm not doing any captioning right now. Um, what are the steps that I could 
possibly take, and maybe you've already outlined them, but what are the steps where I could dip my toe in the water and at least get started doing something? And then how maybe in phases would I get up to really where I really might need to be? Okay, so I like, that's a good question. So Mike's question was, what could you do maybe in phases as a small station? So first off, confession time, I like to solve things in big ways. Let's buy this thing, put it in the rack, set all this up. But the, the small steps would be to do what we were just talking about, like use Premiere or Final Cut or whatever you're using. Maybe you don't want to do this on every program you guys do, so pick the first one or two that you're going to use for this process and try captioning it with the built-in tools. Try doing it without correcting, and then try doing it with correcting, where you actually fix what's wrong there, and see if you guys can start incorporating. Because you can, you can add the captions in post-production, and every one of the major server playback systems will play those captions out. Now, you might not have all the signal path worked out. You might have some converters in there that drop them. So this would also be a great time. If we captioned a file and you put it on your tightrope or you put it on your tell view, you put anything, and then you played it and you went to that TV and you put it up and you saw it was not there, then that's our signal that there's something in the middle that isn't work. Or if it's on the TV but it's not on the web stream, okay, that's our signal that when we get digging into this, the signal path to the web stream or the encoder. Um, besides doing that, another path would just to be start doing some stuff for live meetings, if you have no budget at all, no budget at all, you could still do things using DIY tools. Um, Sun Prairie were the first I knew of anybody doing this, and they were using um, the web captioner uh, uh, web page, webcaptioner.com, and they were feeding it burned in on screen through vMix, I think, and, and actually putting captions on all their programs. And I mean, that costs a lot in time, but it doesn't cost a lot in cash. I mean, obviously time is money, but you know what I mean. You, you, you have to put the time in it, but it, you didn't need a capital funds for him to do that. He already had vMix. He already... Um, so I would say that's one thing. And then if you wanted to just start on... And again, I'm not trying to pitch sell here, but if you wanted to just start at the lowest cost, but we're adding professional captions, you know, I, I, I walk people through all the options. Enco, Link, EEG, and others. But the absolute lowest cost way to start would be with the EEG cloud service, because they have a very inexpensive encoder compared to the other one they sell. They have one that's 10,000 that does everything, and they have one that's like 5,000 that they've removed the ability to work with other services. So you can't use human captioners, you can't use anything else, but it works with their cloud. So that's about 5,000, a little less, and then you could add captioning um, by buying a block of hours for the year. You could just say, let's buy 100 hours at 25 bucks an hour, and then we can caption 100 hours of, of meetings. It's not going to give you everything on your channel, but you know, for, what did I just say, 25 an hour for 100 hours would be 2,500. The encoder is like 4,600. So, so you know, for under $8,000, you could have the gear in and that first 100 hours for the year, and you could assign those to the meetings that you felt were most crucial in the beginning. Because obviously we should be doing every piece of content, but telling someone they have to jump in and do everything is not achievable most of the time. Is that, am I, yeah. is that a good Does suggestion? That work for the channel and for the streaming? Yes. So Mike's asking if that works for the channel. Why am I walking over? I'm answering. Uh, Mike asked if that works for the channel and the streaming. Yes. You apply it in the video signal. And, and, and in most situations, people take their stream signal off of their channel video signal. You know? Not everything, but most people like program the channel, DA it. One goes to the stream encoder, one goes to the TV channel. So we add it to the signal and then we split it to go off to the two places so that both have the captions. And the nice thing about that is, you know, you can stream to YouTube and let them add the captions, but you can't control the thing. So if you're controlling it for your channel, those exact same captions end up on your stream and you won't have a complaint that the mayor was... Or Mayor Bukakis. Yeah. Mayor Bukakis <laughs> got real upset about the YouTube stream last night. What'd you do wrong? Yeah. And you can stream your captions to things like YouTube and Facebook. You just have to have a compatible encoder. Uh, AGA Hilo is the higher end one. I mean, there's probably more expensive ones, but that's the one I, I use a lot on the higher end. And Teradek, uh, is it Cube? I don't know, it might be, I'm not sure what the name of the Teradek, but there, there's a Teradek encoder that can take the SDI signal and pass the captions through. Big thing to know, 
if you currently drop your signal down to HDMI to go into one of the web encoders, because some people do, they like feed their Facebook encoder with HDMI or something, HDMI doesn't carry captions. So even if you got the captions in the SDI signal, if you go SDI to HDI to analog or HDI to your web, it's gone. So you would have to upgrade your stream encoder to be one that takes SDI and doesn't lose the captions. That's the little stuff. I try not to get lost in the little things, but there, there's usually like 80% of the project is figuring out the core thing you're doing. You know, we're going to put in this encoder and this service, and 20% is going through every single black magic converter in the rack and following the wiring and making sure we don't have, you know, a dead zone, a spot where it loses captions. So, so it would be 5,000 for the one. Yeah, hold on. 5,000 for them. Sorry, <laughs> I can't tell who's speaking with mask on. Um, 5,000 for, and you said EEG? Yeah, and I, this is not me trying to pitch and sell it. No, 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 I sell, no, no. I sell all these and I try to be really equal with them. That's why I don't bring any of them to put on the table and I sell them, you know, cassette players and goofy shit because then none of them are like, you showed my competitor's product and not mine. But yeah, EEG's EN537, it's their lower end encoder. It's 4,700, 4,600. I, I do government discounts. And then you said the other one's 10,000. Yep, and you can caption all that. HD 492 is 9999. And does that then caption everything? And you don't have to buy the subscription thing here? Or you still got to do that? Oh, you still got to add it off to something. So there's two pieces here, I'm sorry. You have an encoder. The encoder inserts the captions. That could be a physical encoder, or it could be your, sorry. It could be your Telview or Tightrope or Castus, because they're all adding integrated um, captions. But it's still two parts. There's a part that's listening and generating the text, and there's a part that's inserting in the signal. So if it's in integrated, it's the server doing it. What I like to do is use a appliance, a link or EEG encoder that's just, you know, single purpose. And then there's something that's telling it what to do. So you either pair it with Lexi, which is the, what you can only do with the cheap one, or you can pair it with a human service or a third party cloud service. That HD 492, their expensive one, you could, you could pair with uh, Ericsson's high-end, you know, speech service. Um, but the really good thing about that EN537 that's actually compared to the other solutions I sell is you can buy multiple of those and then put them all in one pool of hours. That's really helpful if you're a multi-channel setup, especially a broke multi-channel setup. Because if you had three channels and you needed to put captioning on all three and you wanted to go the route that I have most people do where they're buying capital and it's a box that can run 24-7, we got to do three of those. And that's a lot of capital. If you need to do captions on three channels or four channels or five channels and you're okay using the inexpensive cloud version, you can just put in three or four encoders and buy 200 hours, 500 hours, 800 hours, and then they all pull from that one thing. So we're just, it'd be like a family plan, I suppose, you know? It's like 25 bucks an hour. Yeah, the, the pricing is you have to buy at least, okay. Usually they sell it on monthly plans where it's 40 bucks an hour, but you're paying for 10, or 30 bucks an hour, you're paying for 20. And then you lose whatever hours you didn't use that month, and you have to pay overage if you go over. So I, I can get into all the details on that, but it, it all depends. The simpler way they let me sell it now is 100 or more hours at 25 bucks an hour, or 500 or more hours at 20 bucks an hour paid for as an annual block. And I love that because it's just really easy to estimate. How many hours did you broadcast last year of meetings? You had 400 hours of meetings? Well, let's buy 500 and have others to use for these programs or buy 400 and... Um, and then the other path, I guess, since we're already talking money, the other way these things work are you can buy a capitalized system, either the Link ACE 2000 or the ENCO and Caption 4. They're both gonna be about 50 some thousand dollars. It's expensive, it's like buying a playback system. But you own it. You got a 10-year software license. You could just caption everything on your channel for as long as you want. Um, Can you lease those? Leasing one of those means a leasing agency buys it for 40, you know, 50,000, and then you pay them monthly. So yes, I did have one customer do it as a lease in Hawaii, but they leased it from Leaf Capital. So I guess if anybody wants to lease, I can connect them with like a capital thing. But usually, I find government just wants to pay out, right? Um, but on the lease side, you can, I'm sorry, you can also lease it by paying just for the year. Like, I want 30 hours a year or 60, or, I'm sorry, for the month. I want 30 hours each month or 60 hours each month. And it's basically like 1000 to 1400 bucks a month if you're paying for it, like, across the year if you wanted 30 to 90 hours. Go ahead, Mike. Have you been approached by any consortia or associations for group pricing? 
Oh, what a good question. Um, early on, when we were doing this, we really pushed the idea of group pricing when we were talking to Wisconsin stations. Uh, me and Mike were doing the reports, right. same in, in Minnesota. Um, at that point, everybody pushed back at me. Not the cities, but the manufacturers, that they don't want group pricing. They want everyone to pay the mag you know, their own plan. So when I got these 100 hours and 500 hours plans, I was like, great, I got this. And then they're like, no, no, but you can't combine it between customers. So can a consortium be the customer? Yes. But I, unfortunately, cannot say, hey, Boyce needs 400 hours and she needs 200 hours. I'll just buy 600 hours at a better price and split up. They've been really reluctant to not let me kind of like gang up individual customers. But if, you had, but if you had a group coming to you and say, if you had a group coming to you and saying, we want mm -hmm. to buy 6,000 hours. Oh, yeah. I'll, honestly, if, and again, I'm not trying to push people to organize in this way, but if people said, hey, these 10 members of WCM or these 10 members of ACM Midwest yeah, or wanted, MACTA. or MACTA, right. if they said these members want to buy X number of encoders and they want X price on it, they want a better than normal discount, and they want all of these hours, yeah, if I went to them and I said, well, the, uh, the MACTA consortium is purchasing 12 servers in 65 hours. They go, oh, great, a new customer. It's just when I tried to go to them and be like, hey, I'm generating a quote for these guys, these guys, and these guys, and they want to buy together, then they reject the idea. But if we, if we called it a consortium that already existed, or we said the joint purchasing authority of WCM is purchasing blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. Kind of along those lines, you know, Ken, is the technology, is the technology good enough now where, let's say we had, uh, three different peg operations in one county, so they're close together. Can yeah. can one buy the captioning stuff and then share it with the other two? We could. Cities? We'd have to be a, if we were creative. We could the outright the outright buy systems that you can buy outright. Uh, you can get them with an offline mode that you can process video twice regular speed. So like drop folder and you drop in files from four or five different cities and they get processed. You put more effort in if you'd wanted to have like a separate language model for each city that had that city's council people or you could just have one global one. But yeah, you could do that. It would basically involve one of the stations in the group saying, hey, we got capital funds. We have no problem buying this thing with our capital funds. And now we're going to let you guys process however many videos you want on it as part of X membership fee, or you pay us a dollar per hour for videos we'll caption for you, or whatever. Um, the limitation would be, if you were using it live, you can only use it for one thing at a time. And if you buy one of the boxes that's a combined live and offline, it only does the offline when it's not live. So if I was going to do this, I would probably buy a standalone offline box, like the the one from Link, or even like Enco, and I would make that just dedicated offline and never use it for live, and then you would just always be feeding stuff in, unless, or, or only use it live when there's like an overflow, like we have our main channels live, almost all of our meetings are on channel eight, and once in a while we have two meetings, so you know, this one's maybe both, but 90% of the time. Just so you're not like waiting all night for an hour to pop up where you can transcode. So that's a long answer, but yes, it could be that if one station's got capital funds and no operating, and the other station's got operating funds and no capital, the capital station could buy the thing, and the operating station could pay them to, to utilize it. There's, so you could have your cake. You could have your cake and eat it, too. Thank you. <laughs> See, I got Mike and Mike here as the ringers. You guys may have noticed that I didn't have enough stuff to talk about, so I just asked them to ask the questions that I forgot. Thank you guys both. I owe you an extra cupcake. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate this. This is the most fun I've had in a long time. <laughs>